Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott. We have lots to cover today. After the news, we have updates on the Learjet crash in San Diego, including a letter from the son of one of the pilots, plus ways to use Garmin visual approaches in foreflight when circling to land. And later, we'll talk with Matt Lane about the free Virga app, which makes it easy to submit a PyRep. And of course, the big problem with PyReps is pilots don't submit enough of them. So the Virga app should help. Later, we'll have some of your emails and comments. Thanks for sending those, as I love hearing from you and sharing them on the show. Last week in episode 215, we talked with Dmitry Doknovsky about buying an SR-22 and then flying it back with me across the country. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out. And by the way, for most of last week, Aviation News Talk was ranked number one of the over 200 aviation podcasts listed in the Apple Podcast app, and I'll tell you more about that later. And this is January, where people think about goals for 2022. Let me suggest that one of them could be to help support this show, as we are listener-supported and still ad-free. You can sign up as a member at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and I'll read your name on the show. This week in the news, the EPA announces it will investigate the use of leaded fuels in aircraft. A pilot falsely claims he's a CFI and then crashes a helicopter. FedEx is seeking permission to add lasers to some aircraft to defend against missiles. And we have an odd story about one city's effort to fight crows in a way that may impact pilots. All this and more, and the news starts now. From TheHill.com, EPA to assess health impacts of leaded aircraft fuel. The Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, will investigate the potential negative impacts of human health from the emissions of airplanes using leaded fuel, the agency announced. A 2016 EPA report indicated piston engine planes are the single largest airborne source of lead exposure. Leaded fuel from other sources was phased out in 1996 under the Clean Air Act, but it remains the only usable fuel for piston engine airplanes, about 170,000 of which are currently airborne. Overall, airborne lead exposure in the U.S. has fallen 99% since 1980. The agency will issue a formal proposal for public comment in 2022 before determining a final action next year. Quote, EPA has been investigating the air quality impact of lead emissions from piston engine aircraft near airports for years, and now we're going to apply that information to determine whether this pollution endangers human health and welfare, according to EPA Administrator Michael Reagan. Lead exposure from piston engine aircraft is a particular issue for communities in close proximity to airports that service such planes. A 2020 EPA report indicated that more than 5 million people live within 500 meters of such airports' runways, with more than 160,000 children attending school in the same range. The EPA took action in response to petitions from a coalition of environmental groups. The oldest of the petitions was from Friends of Earth, dates back to 2006. From WBIR.com, a helicopter pilot in a fatal accident in Sevier County had been ordered not to fly and faces federal indictment. Matthew Jones, 35, faces prosecution in federal court in Utah on counts of mail fraud and operating as an airman without an airman certificate. The man flying the helicopter that crashed December 29th in Sevier County, Tennessee, killing his passenger, is facing federal prosecution for falsely claiming he was a CFI in Utah and had been told by a federal magistrate judge one week before the crash that he was not to fly any aircraft. Matthew Jones, 35, suffered injuries when the least Robinson R-44 helicopter he was piloting went down on a ridge at about 2,000 feet near the Sevier Cock County line, which is southeast of Knoxville. His passenger and business associate, Julianne Wagner, died in the crash. Both were from Utah. Andrew Choate, spokesman for the U.S. Attorney's Office in Utah, confirmed Jones's identity and said there's an ongoing investigation. Jones was already being prosecuted in Utah for mail fraud, as well as operating as an airman without an airman certificate. Jones is in stable condition at the University of Tennessee Medical Center, where he was transported after the crash on December 29th. The NTSB is investigating the crash. Jones was at the controls, a Cock County Sheriff's Office report states. Wagner didn't know how to fly the aircraft, according to friends. Jones and Wagner were aloft about eight minutes the afternoon of December 29th after taking off from the Gatlinburg Pigeon Forge Airport before the helicopter went down. It flew at an elevation between 1,500 and 2,000 feet. Weather conditions were overcast, drizzly, and foggy. 
And from the website of the DOT's Office of Inspector General in a post dated October 2021 about the fraud indictment, it says, In May 2019, Jones falsely claimed to be a CFI and signed a contract to train an individual who wanted to obtain fixed wing and rotary wing ratings. According to FAA records, Jones advertised his status as a CFI through Instagram posts and text messages. Furthermore, Jones fraudulently withdrew approximately $10,000 from a bank account dedicated for flight instruction purposes and instead used the funds to pay for rent, a cell phone, and miscellaneous purchases from Walmart. From simplyflying.com, the FAA issued a brief ground stop on Monday last week. A brief FAA ground stop called on Monday afternoon is creating some speculation about the cause of the actions. Ground stops are highly unusual in non-weather situations, and although normal activities were resumed in around 15 minutes, the FAA has been tight-lipped on the reason behind the move. However, North Korea is known to have fired a ballistic missile at around the same time, leading to conclusions being drawn. For a brief moment on Monday, all flights on the west coast of the U.S. ground to a halt. The FAA issued a ground stop notice. A ground stop is an air traffic control measure that slows or stops the flow of aircraft to a particular airport, usually implemented due to weather or an operational hazard at the airport. The ground stop only lasted about 15 minutes, around 2.30 Pacific time. It included a temporary pause on all flights taking off and landing in the area, as well as aviators being instructed to land. It's a highly irregular event, with some ATC staffers stating it was the first time such a widespread ground stop had been called since the events of 9-11. A number of West Coast airports confirmed the ground stop, as reported to NBC, including San Diego, Ontario, and Oakland. ATC shared what are claimed to be flight strips from the ground stop on Reddit, with images subsequently shared on Twitter. While the FAA indicates the ground stop was just for limited West Coast airports, ATC recordings from Honolulu suggest similar instructions were received there as well. Other recordings refer to the incident as a national ground stop, with some pilots being told to land as soon as possible. From PaddleYourOwnCanoe.com, FedEx is seeking permission to install, get this, missile downing lasers to some of its aircraft. FedEx Express is seeking permission from the FAA to install a high-tech missile defense system on some of its aircraft. The system could use laser beams to detect and shoot down heat-seeking missiles, according to an FAA proposal filed last week. The FAA could give the nod for FedEx Express to equip some Airbus A321-200 aircraft with systems so long as certain conditions are met. FedEx Express operates a global operation, including in countries with ongoing conflict where Western targets could come under fire. In recent years, the FAA notes that there have been several reports of civilian aircraft coming under fire from what are called Man Portable Air Defense Systems, or MAN Pads, or more commonly referred to as rocket launchers. The system that FedEx Express wants to use would direct an infrared laser toward an incoming heat seeking missile, which would interrupt the missile's ability to track the heat of the aircraft and hopefully throw it off course. The FAA is inclined to approve the system, but is concerned that inadvertent operation could pose a danger to humans. Israeli flag carrier El Al is believed to be the only commercial airline to equip its aircraft with a missile defense system although the system that LL uses relies upon an older flare technology to throw the missiles off course. From the OCRegister.com, Delta Airlines pilot shortage prompts cuts to a regional service. Now, you may remember that last week here on Aviation News Talk, we reported that Delta had eliminated the requirement of a bachelor's degree to be hired as a first officer. Well, this week, Delta announced that they have trimmed regional flying by as much as 25% for the first half of this year because of a pilot shortage a lingering effect for several carriers from the early days of the coronavirus pandemic. When airlines moved to replace thousands of pilots who took incentives to retire early in 2020, the carrier turned first to their traditional hiring pool at regional partners. Pandemic-related disruptions to training at those smaller airlines contributed to the shortage by preventing first officers from being promoted to captain. Delta expects to add 100 to 200 pilots a month into next year, CEO Ed Bastian said on an earnings call last week. The company hasn't had a shortage of pilots or applicants at its mainline operations, he said. The airline is pretty confident by the second half of this year it will be able to restore services to communities that were cut in the first half, according to President Glenn Hostein, who was on the call. Separately, United Airlines Holdings, Inc. has grounded 100 regional jets because of the same problem, according to CEO Scott Kirby, who has said that they have discontinued service to an unspecified number of cities. 
From avweb.com, the FAA has published more than 1,400 notams regarding potential radar altimeter disruptions related to the upcoming launch of Verizon and AT&T's 5G C-band wireless broadband networks. In general, the notams prohibit operations such as the use of heads-up display and enhanced flight vision systems to touchdown, auto land, and helicopter operations requiring radar altimeter data, including hover autopilot modes and CAT AB performance class takeoffs and landings. They also include an exemption for approved alternate methods of compliance, although the FAA has yet to sign off on any. The notams are scheduled to go into effect on January 19th alongside the 5G rollout, which has been delayed twice since the original planned launch date of December 5th, 2021. Last week, the FAA published a list of 50 airports that will be protected from 5G signals for six months. In addition, two 5G-related ADs were issued last December. And here's a related story from avweb.com. FAA exempts helicopter medevacs from 5G restrictions. The FAA has issued an exemption allowing helicopter air ambulance operators to conduct rescue flights if their radar altimeters are affected or could be affected by interference from 5G cell phone signals. Medevac helicopter operations were especially hard hit by the more than 1,400 notams issued by the FAA, restricting operations that require the use of radar altimeters. Under FAA regs, not only do commercial helicopters require a radar altimeter, it must be working before the pilots can use night vision goggles to help them land at night. Most medevac pilots use goggles when landing and taking off on the roads, parking lots, and open fields that they often use for such flights, and also at hospital helipads. The exemption allows them to use the goggles in areas covered by the NOTAM as long as they can be warned of obstructions through radio contact with people on the ground, or they can do a high-altitude check of the landing area using a movable searchlight if ground personnel aren't available. In granting the exemption, the FAA said it was in the public interest that helicopter medevac flights be allowed to continue and that it was satisfied the additional precautions were enough to do it safely. But it also set a two-year limit on the exemption while operators either modify or replace radar altimeters that are susceptible to 5G interference. In international news, from AOPA.org, Canada commences ADSB trials. While ADSB out has been mandatory in certain U.S. airspace for two years, Canada opted to delay a similar mandate pending the outcome of trial runs, the first of which began in December. While other factors may complicate cross-border air travel for some time to come, pilots of FAA-registered aircraft can cross ADSB off that list until at least 2023. Canada's somewhat different approach to modern airspace surveillance is still worth considering now, particularly by owners of FAA-registered aircraft who may be looking to upgrade or install ADSB out capability. Canada delayed its own mandate in late 2019, weeks before it otherwise would have taken effect. The delay was in response to lobbying by aviation stakeholders, including AOPA, which in a letter also signed by many other groups, noted that at the time that Canada's space-based approach to airspace surveillance would have a significant negative impact on NAV Canada's most cost-sensitive users. The reason for that is antenna diversity. As aviation stakeholders noted in 2019, Canadian regulators had erroneously assumed that most or all GA aircraft had antennas mounted on the top and bottom of the aircraft, as required for installation of TCAS-2 systems used in commercial turbine transport aircraft, but not mandatory for aircraft with fewer than 30 passenger seats weighing less than 33,000 pounds, that are operated outside of RVSM airspace. Canadian regulators, to their credit, pumped the brakes with respect to low-altitude operations, though NAV Canada did implement space-based ADSB in 2019, working with Arion to deploy a satellite surveillance solution covering North Atlantic airspace at or above 29,000 feet. A network of Arion satellites receives 1090 megahertz aircraft transmissions and relays the data to be displayed in ATC facilities and the flight decks of other aircraft. Using satellites instead of terrestrial radio receivers to monitor ADSB reduces the infrastructure costs dramatically, but presents problems for aircraft without top-mounted antennas and limits operations to 1090 MHz transponders. NAV Canada began ADSB trials to evaluate equipment and procedures and gain additional operation experience and feedback from aviators starting on December 10th. Participation is optional and largely automated, though pilots will need to input a flight ID number that matches exactly the aircraft identification in a filed flight plan and have a 1090 megahertz ADSB transponder that is able to transmit to satellites for their flight to generate data for the trial. 
From roboticsandautomationnews.com, Reliable Robotics launches new cargo airline. Reliable Robotics is focused on launching a new type of airline powered by advanced automation. Starting from the ground up, the airline team is prioritizing hiring world-class talent and establishing safety management and operational procedures. Robert Rose, co-founder and CEO of Reliable Robotics, who, by the way, we interviewed back in episode 173 of Aviation News Talk, said, We've taken deliberate steps to recruit a reputable team and further develop our experiences in the air cargo sector, but certifying aircraft systems for safe routine operations takes time. We will introduce automation into the airline operation once we have proven to ourselves in the FAA that these systems can be deployed safely for commercial use. Jeff Drees, Director of Cargo Strategy for Reliable Robotics and former co-owner and Chief Commercial Officer of Ameriflight, will lead cargo operations and recruit key hires for the Part 135 subsidiary. Drees serves as Chief Commercial Officer for Ameriflight and oversaw more than 1,500 domestic and international departures per week while the company was flying over 75,000 hours per year. Ameriflight became the biggest 135 cargo carrier in the world, operating 175 aircraft in the U.S. and Puerto Rico, for the largest logistics integrators in all overnight shippers. Reliable Robotics is building a remotely piloted system that has the capability to land on almost any airstrip, enabling point-to-point deliveries to underserved regional airports. Once the system is certified for commercial use, cargo operators will be able to expand direct routes to more locations and gain the flexibility to fly more frequently with remotely piloted aircraft. The versatile system can be adapted to almost any aircraft, including new electric and hybrid electric propulsion platforms. And finally, from CaliforniaNewsTimes.com, flocks of pesky crows take over downtown Sunnyvale, how the city is dealing with a nuisance. Thousands of crows have left a list of complaints for residents and visitors to downtown Sunnyvale. The sidewalks are covered in white with bird droppings, crows interfere with a supper, and their caw is making noise problems. When the sun begins to set, they come up, says resident Frank Hampton. We've tried multiple things in the past. There were falcons and reflectors on the trees, but nothing seems to help, said Mayor Larry Klein. He said the city is now looking at cheaper technology. Specifically, it's a $20 green laser to bother birds leaving. It's a lot better than spending hundreds of dollars spraying sidewalks every few weeks, he said. Mayor Klein said the Downtown Association is also providing lasers to restaurants along historic Murphy Avenue. However, the Santa Clara Valley Audubon Association said it was deeply concerned about crows. In a statement to ABC7 News, Managing Director Matthew Dodder said, We are not considering the use of lasers as a rational way to deal with the problems of overpopulation of these intelligent birds. They will leave for a while. In addition, lasers pose a blind threat to birds that we cannot tolerate, but also pose a risk to humans and aircraft. So next time you get hit with a green laser in the skies, it might be from someone fighting off the crows. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, some updates on the Learjet crash in San Diego. Then we'll be talking with Matt Lane about the Virga app. And finally, we'll have more of your feedback and questions. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let me give you a few updates regarding the Learjet crash that occurred in San Diego late last month, including an email from the son of one of the pilots that was killed in that crash. The NTSB preliminary report has come out for the crash, and really it has nothing new in it. It did confirm one thing I've said that some other people have been getting wrong. The NTSB published an annotated map that shows where the aircraft was for each of its transmissions, As I've said all along, the request to turn up the airport lights occurred nearly two minutes before the crash, when the aircraft was still about a mile north of the airport. I figured that out by back-timing the original ATC audio from the moment of the crash to figure out where they were for each of their transmissions. A number of people have said the transmission to turn up the lights came just before the crash, and they probably drew that incorrect conclusion by listening to a YouTube video in which most of the dead space between transmissions had been removed. Now, I'm just finishing up two videos I'm creating for YouTube on Circling Approaches Explained, and I'll let you know in a future episode after I've published those videos. In the meantime, you may want to go out onto YouTube and subscribe to our channel, which is called Aviation News Talk, so you'll get notified when those videos come out. Two of the things that I'm going to talk about are how pilots can use the Garmin visual approaches and for-flight visual approaches and traffic pattern features to assist them 
when they are circling to land following an instrument approach. And I'll talk about both of those in more detail in a couple of moments, but some of you have apparently already been thinking the same thing. Here's an email that came from HR in Chicago. He said, good morning, Max, catching up on your shows and just listen to 214, which has yet another good discussion of the pitfalls of circling approaches. My home airport has six runways, but only one of the six has published approaches, making a circling approach not uncommon, though I still try to avoid them and have high personal minimums for circling. I fly a G1000 NXI, which has visual approaches for all six runways, and I love this feature. When I have to fly a circling approach upon breaking off the published approach to circle, I will usually switch the G1000 approach procedures from the published approach to the visual approach for the intended runway. This gives me a bright magenta line with both lateral and vertical navigation. The lateral navigation gives not only the obvious D-bar and magenta line on the moving map, but also cross-track error so I can ensure I'm between 0.8 and 1 miles out on the downwind and no more than 1.3 nautical miles to stay within the protected area. Now that would be the protected area for category A. Uh, the vertical navigation gives a standard glide slope that really helps me ensure a stabilized approach on final, especially with all the maneuvering necessary for tight end circling approaches. If any of your listeners are unaware of this feature, I highly recommend they learn about it as it has helped my flying. The downside of this practice is that one, it involves some button pushing during a high workload time. Two, it erases the published approach from the FMS and therefore the missed approach sequence is deleted. And three, visual approaches do not ensure terrain clearance. I'm wondering what your take is on using the visual approaches to circle and how you teach circling approaches in regard to programming the navigator. One other option is to have the visual approaches loaded in foreflight and simply switch your attention from the G1000 to the iPad upon breaking out, but this isn't perfect either. Thanks for your insights and all of your efforts you put into the show. It makes us all better. Signed, HR. And by the way, I also had an email from uh, Patreon supporter David Mackler, and this was actually almost two years ago. He said, you mentioned in the news that the G1000 upgrade includes visual approaches. Would you elaborate on that in a future episode? Given the large variability, how can a GPS know how to provide guidance for a visual approach. And my note back to him said, yes, I plan to talk about this soon. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> two years is not soon, but talking about it now, nonetheless, I also wrote, I actually have to write up something about it for another project, which was my G3000 book. So when I get that done, I'll remember to talk about it in an upcoming show. Very briefly, you can think of it as being like a WASP-based GPS approach that leads to every runway end. It has a point about four or five miles out that you can go direct to, from there, it will turn the plane onto final and track the glide path down. You can also give yourself vectors to that final, and once you've intercepted the final, the autopilot will track the glide path down to the runway. And so now let me read you the section from my Max Truscott's G3000 and G5000 glass cockpit handbook, and I'll have a link in here where you can order that if you happen to fly a turboprop or jet that has that book. By the way, these also apply to the Garmin G1000 and also to the GTN 650 and 750 if you happen to have those navigators. And here's what I've written in my book. It says, some G3000 equipped aircraft lets you load and fly visual approaches, which include vertical guidance in much the same way you load and fly other instrument approach procedures. You can use them when cleared for an IFR visual approach or when flying VFR into an airport. These visual approaches help pilots fly stabilized approaches, reducing the chance of arriving high and fast when flying visually. They also ensure you're aligned with the correct runway and not another runway or taxiway. Visual approaches always provide lateral guidance. Vertical guidance is provided most of the time, but if there are obstructions along the approach path within three nautical miles to the runway, advisory vertical guidance is not provided. Published data is used to determine the glide path angle or GPA and threshold crossing height or TCH for the selected runway. If no published data is available, a three degree GPA and a 50 foot TCH is used for a visual approach. And then I wrote in bold type, note that obstacle clearance is not provided for visual approaches. So you need to verify your own obstacle clearance which is another way of saying it's possible, though highly unlikely, that these visual approaches could fly you through a mountain. So you need to be visual. You need to be verifying that you're clear of the terrain. Continuing back with what I've written, it says, when doing visual approaches at night, display the VSD, that's the vertical situation display, 
window at the bottom of the navigation map and verify any visual approaches you've loaded don't pass through or close to terrain. Also, not all airports in the G3000 database support visual approaches. Now this VSD window, that would be the same as the profile window that you would see on a G1000 and prospective aircraft. Continuing on, loading a visual approach is done in the same way you'd load any other instrument approach. From the active flight plan screen or the home screen, touch the proc key. Then touch the approach button to open the approach selection screen. Your destination airport will appear in the airport button if you've entered it into your flight plan. Then touch the approach button to open the select approach screen. Scroll if necessary and touch one of the buttons labeled visual followed by a runway number. Then choose straight or vectors. Finally, touch the load or the activate button to add the approach to your active flight plan. Selecting straight creates a waypoint on the extended center line of the runway about five miles out from the runway. If you activate the approach or use the direct to button to the waypoint in the active flight plan labeled straight, you'll get course guidance to that waypoint and then to the runway. If you select vectors, the G3000 draws a magenta line on the navigation map extending 30 nautical miles from the FAF. You can then fly heading to join the line. Note that if you use the autopilot to join a visual approach that you've loaded with vectors, your intercept angle to join the final approach course cannot exceed 45 degrees. If it does, the nav mode will not go active. The autopilot will remain in heading mode and you'll fly through the final approach course. That limitation also applies to flying any instrument approach you fly with vectors using the G3000. By contrast, if you load a visual approach using straight instead of vectors, and you navigate to straight using nav mode, the autopilot should make the turn to final regardless of the intercept angle. And by the way, this requirement when you've loaded a visual approach with vectors to be joining the final at less than 45 degrees in order to assure that your autopilot switches from heading mode to nav is something that I discovered and subsequently the manual was updated by Garmin after we ran across this. I was with a gentleman in a vision jet flying into Reno we had loaded vectors and he was coming at the uh, final approach at probably fairly close to a 90 degree angle. The autopilot flew straight through it without joining. We contacted Garmin and they went and added a note to the manual that says, when you're flying the visual approach with vectors, you have to be within 45 degrees of the final in order for the autopilot to switch into the nav mode. Now let's talk about ForeFlight for a few minutes. You can easily add a visual approach to any runway in ForeFlight. Visual approaches are available in the procedure advisor in both the approach and traffic pattern menus. When you add a visual approach, it adds a three and a half mile long straight in segment to whichever runway you select, and it will show the traffic pattern altitude at the point where you join the straight in visual approach segment. To add an approach after entering a route in the maps tab, touch the procedure button and then the approach button. And then below the instrument approaches listed, you'll find a list of visual approaches to each runway. Touch the straight in button and then the add to route button. Or if you'd like to choose an altitude that's different than the recommended altitude, after touching the straight in button, touch the select button to see all of the recommended altitudes for your airport and select one, or touch the altitude shown and key in a custom altitude of your choice, then touch the add to route button. You can also add a traffic pattern entry to your route, which could be helpful for visualizing flying a circle to land following an instrument approach. Note that the distances shown for the traffic patterns may not be appropriate for your aircraft, especially if you're flying a faster aircraft. I measured the pattern shown for one example I tried, and it showed a downwind leg that was offset 0.8 miles from the runway in a final that was one nautical mile long. Now, these will work great for an aircraft flying at about 100 knots or slower, but faster aircraft will need to fly a larger pattern. Regardless, the four flight traffic patterns do an excellent job at orienting pilots to the headings that they need to fly for each leg. As Rob Mark and I discussed in episode 214, the Learjet pilots flew a traffic pattern that made it impossible for them to complete the two turns to final at the speeds they needed to fly. And tools like the Garmin visual approaches and the four flight visual approaches and traffic pattern features could have helped them considerably in flying a proper flight path in the low visibility conditions they were experiencing. Now, ForeFlight has a video on how to use their visual approaches and traffic pattern features, and I'll include a link to that video in the show notes. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I received an email last week from the son of one of the 
Learjet pilots, it was very short. I'll read part of it. He said, thank you for being so respectful of my father and the rest of the crew. When talking about jet in November 880 Zulu, I went up with him many times and we always landed on 27 right. May God be with you and don't forget to hug your family. I wrote back to him, I'm so sorry for your loss. I can't even imagine how terrible this has been for you and your family. Thank you. I hope Rob and I were respectful. In my 50 years of flying, my view has changed considerably about pilots involved in accidents. I know that the vast majority of them are excellent pilots, but having flown with hundreds of pilots, I know that all of us make mistakes on practically every flight. Usually the mistakes are tiny, we quickly recognize them, take corrective action, and they don't amount to anything. But sometimes we don't catch them and then they start to build and on rare occasions they turn into an accident. I've come to realize that can happen to any pilot no matter how hard we work at our profession. I also find it quite sobering because as hard as I work at my craft, I know that I too could someday find myself missing a tiny error that builds into another and leads to an accident. As an aviation educator, I'm trying to educate pilots so they'll recognize some of the subtle errors that sometimes get missed. As I've said in my podcast, I do it because my goal is to help people avoid accidents and hopefully save some lives. I'm sure your dad loved flying and being in the air, but also knew that there is always some risk involved. I imagine he also enjoyed serving others by flying an air ambulance. For years, I flew volunteer doctors and dentists to Mexico where they provided free services, and I enjoyed using my skills to help others. I'm sure your dad did as well. I'm sorry too that you lost him so suddenly. A similar thing happened to me. My father died suddenly when he was in his 40s, and my wife lost her father when she was 14. It's terrible when these things happen, and our loved ones don't get to live as long as we'd like. May his memory always be a blessing to you and your family. Well, coming up next, we'll be talking to Matt Lane about the Virgo app, and later we'll have more of your emails and questions, all right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Now let me tell you a little bit about Matt Lane. Matt is a former high-tech executive and entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of Streamline Brands, in addition to Virga, has founded several other successful businesses. He's an instrument-rated multi-engine pilot with about 400 hours in a Cirrus SR-22 and 400 hours in the Eclipse jet. Now here's our conversation with Matt Lane. Well, Matt, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Thanks, Max. Thanks for having me. This is fantastic. Well, we talked about you and the Virga app back in episode 182, but this is the first time we've actually had you on the show, and you've got some new things to talk about. But for those who aren't familiar with the Virga app, uh, please give us the 30,000-foot view of the app, what it does, and how it's helpful for pilots. So that'll be like the, the flight level 300 version, huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the, uh, the Virga app was designed to try to grease the skids, if you will, uh, for GA pilots to get more pi reps put into the system. And, you know, the genesis of it is I was flying around one day when I was a relatively new pilot, which I still am a relatively new pilot. And um, I, I really wished I would have known what was going on out ahead of me. And I really didn't have very, very, very many avenues other than getting on the radio and asking. And uh, I was a little self-conscious of it. I really didn't want to use the radio bandwidth to do it. And, and what I figured was, hey, there's if you look at all the different apps out there for uh, traffic, you know, ground traffic like cars, Waze, for example, uh, Google Maps, whatever, you get a lot of information on, on what's going on out in front of you. Why not use the same kind of technology for airplanes? And Virga was born. And so what we did is just go out and try to use the, the massive number of uh, phones, cell phones that are out there to try to um, create opportunities to add Pyrex to the system and share that information with other pilots around. Well, one of the things I really love about the app is the ability to basically draw a circle on a map of the area for which you'd like to get notified for a PIREP. So I've done that for San Francisco, and it's rainy today, and we have PIREPs all over the place. Talk about that and the alerts capability. So the alerts function um, within uh, Berg is one of the ways that I get the most value out of it personally. Um, so what I, I do is just like you did, Max, I set uh, geo alerts around or geo fences around areas and airspaces that I know I'm going to be flying in quite often. So, for example, I fly about weekly down to Oklahoma City to visit my daughter and, uh, and watch her play college volleyball. So I have an alert set up and I have an alert set up not only uh, uh, 
lat long wise, but also airspace wise vertically. And I know that when I, uh, when uh, PyREPs get uh, submitted in that airspace that I get alerts on my phone proactively, um, which is fantastic, even when I'm not flying, because it tells me when things are happening. It allows me to track the kind of weather pattern patterns around the areas that I'm flying most of the time anyway. And I find I'm just more in tune with the weather. But because of that alert function, it, it, Virga has become one of my primary flight pre-flight planning tools. So, you know, a couple, three hours before I get ready to head to the airport, I'm looking at those alerts and making sure I understand what's going on on either side of my trip. Well, you've got a lot of features on the app, but let's jump right to the big news that you have. Tell us about that. Well, what we're most excited about is the fact that just in the past couple of weeks, we were approved by the FAA slash Aviation Weather Center and Lidos so that all PIREPs that are submitted through Virga are now automatically pumped into AWC and into essentially the, the air traffic control airspace. So now uh, you'll, uh, apps that are, or PIREPs that are submitted through Virga are, are sent all the way through all the other flight planning apps that are out there as well. And you'll see them every now and then when they show up, because they will say at the end, uh, in the remarks powered by Virga. <laughs> Sometimes when we're flying, we have cellular data available to us and you can upload a PIREP right there while you're still in flight and sometimes not talk about how you would handle a PIREP if you weren't able to get a cell phone connection in the air. Yeah. The way that it's, that the app works is that when you submit a PIREP and you don't have data connectivity, first the app warns you when you're in, in flight and it'll say low da- uh, data connectivity. So you know that that's happening. Then it stages that PIREP so that at any point in time uh, through the flight or when you get on the ground, when you do get data connectivity, it will automatically submit that into the system. Um, so you can, you can manually push it and refresh it and that sort of stuff. But not many users do that. They just kind of wait for it automatically to happen. Um, when I uh, initially came up with the concept of Virga, um, I was actually flying at 11,000 feet. Uh, and I was on my way home from Omaha to Denver, which is where I live. And um, flying along, I was not instrument rated at the time. Like I said, I was a brand new pilot. And as, I, as I'm flying along, I get stuck above a cloud layer. And that cloud layer... For, from what it seemed like to me, um, extended in perpetuity, and I had no idea how I was going to get down. Um, and I, I had to make a, a choice at that point because I was going to run out of fuel to be if I was going to get to Denver, couldn't get down, and had to return back to get below the cloud there to decide whether or not there was a hole in the clouds that I could actually descend through. Um, and as I was calling to air traffic control and doing all this other stuff, the reality of the fact was is that the way I found out that the clouds broke up is I did have a cell connection. I called my wife on the ground in Denver, found out that there were no clouds in Denver and it was worth continuing. So, you know, air traffic control at 11,000 feet, they don't have a lot of PIREPs out there between Omaha and Denver, you know, on the Eastern Plains. And uh, they really weren't much help. And so that was that cell phone connection that uh, that really was ended up saving the day and, and kind of the, was the basis of, of the Virga data connection. And I think a lot of pilots don't give PIREPs just because they're concerned that they might get the format wrong and they don't want to be embarrassed that they make a mistake. And gosh, you know, who wants to be embarrassed by being wrong? Which, by the way, is something that we should never worry about in aviation. Exactly. You always need to ask questions. You always need to be willing to speak up. We should not be embarrassed about anything. But what I really like about this is how as I walk through putting through a PIREP you kind of take away the mystery about the formatting and make it pretty easy. Why don't you just walk us through generating a new PIREP? Yeah, it, uh, the, the design center for the app was to try to be able to enable a user to submit a PIREP in five taps of the screen or less. So we did a lot of engineering to make sure that we did take away the formatting and the mystery and the, and the, the worry about doing it right. Uh, so you simply open up the app, hit a button and say, hey, I'm ready to submit a PIREP right there. It's going to read all the information off your GPS on your phone. So it's going to pre-populate where you are uh, spatially and it's going to pre-populate um, uh, the various different aspects of the of your profile in that in that PIREP. At that point, then you just simply select which types of PIREPs you want to submit. Let's say I'm in clouds and I want to submit clouds. I want to submit icing because I'm in some minor or minor icing. 
I hit those two buttons, boom, it gives me the next set of criteria for each of those um, types of PyReps. I just tap a couple of uh, features on those and then hit submit. The, the one thing that we do with uh, Verga that is a little bit unique and kind of outside of normal format, if you will, is that we also ask the user to take a picture. And we find that those pictures out the window are one of the most valuable things because as we all know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So being able to see what those actual conditions are outside the windscreen tied to the actual formatted text, as well as the raw text, um, is all of that's taken care of for you by the app and submitted in. On top of it, you don't ever have to talk to anybody. And a lot of times, new pilots, especially me, when I was new, was just I was self-conscious. And I didn't really want to go out and try try to do all that stuff with the, on the radio because I was afraid someone was going to listen to me and think I was doing it wrong. So you can just do it without talking to anybody. It gets submitted and, and away you go. So previously, the app essentially shared PyReps with other users of your app. So I presume that's who got the photos. Those photos don't go up to Lidos today, do they? They do go up to Lidos today. Um, now, Lidos doesn't have the ability yet to include those on Aviation Weather Center. Um, but it is the intent of Lidos to try to get those into their database uh, so that users can start to view that stuff as well. In fact, it's kind of not necessarily off record, but it's kind of outside of the design center of what everybody's trying to do with AWC. At the same time, it's the thing that makes uh, folks up at AWC really excited. It's that video and, um, and uh, picture evidence of what's happening that I think everybody believes gets to become very valuable. Well, here's something else that really gets pilots excited. Talk about the pricing on the app. Well, it's free. <laughs> How's that? Uh, free is good. Um, you know, initially we, we struggled with, through lots of different types of models around the app and we weren't really sure how to make it work um, because ultimately the infrastructure has to be funded and the development support has to be funded. And, and ultimately we decided that that was just something that, I was going to support. So, you know, my hope is, is that uh, personally, if we can leave a, uh, a stamp on aviation safety and help people get more PIREPs of the system, especially below the flight levels, because when you look at the number of PIREPs that are submitted annually, um, there's very, very few, uh, relatively few PIREPs that are submitted below flight level 180. Um, and so if we can get more PI reps down there for the GA pilots below the flight levels, I think that it will ultimately improve safety, especially tagging some of those pictures on there. And if we can leave our stamp on aviation, just simply saying that we improve safety and increase the number of PI reps, I think that's good enough. You've also got the ability to share this information, for example, within a club or among a group of friends or things like that. Talk about how a flight school or a club might use this. It's interesting that that feature actually was designed exactly around a flight school uh, use model. What we started to talk to, uh, we were talking to CFIs who were using it. And what we started to realize is that when a CFI would go, a group of CFIs would go up in a flight school with students, they'd start to text each other out in the practice area as to what was what the actual conditions were so they could help keep new pilots that would be afraid of various different conditions out of there and didn't want to destroy the lesson. Um, and so as you look through those text messages, you realize that's all they're doing is just sharing actual PIREPs without using a PIREP. Uh, so we created this feature, which is a bit of a social network inside of Virga uh, that allows uh, a group of people to friend each other. And automatically when they submit a PIREP, all of their friends get a notification that the PIREP has been submitted. And so it's an automatic kind of information sharing for small groups. And what other kinds of things would you like pilots to know about Virga? So uh, the one, one thing I'd like pilots to know is um, once you start to use the app, how it becomes just a uh, kind of a common piece of flight planning and also wrap up post-flight. I've found not only do I use that geo alert function that we were talking about previously, um, but I've also found that now as I've gotten into the pattern, I feel bad if I don't actually submit about four or five PI reps along my flight. And, you know, I think that if, if all of us start to understand that, and I'm not trying to, to preach on PI reps necessarily, but I am trying to say that once you start using the app, you kind of just start getting into it and you, it, you start to realize it is for the good of the community. And, you know, before you know it, 
three or four pie reps of flight is just kind of common practice. So it's kind of, it starts to become kind of fun. Um, so, uh, hopefully, hopefully we get, uh, a, a larger user base than we have right now, which by the way, the user base is quite nice. And, uh, a lot of people are getting a lot of value out of it, but with your help, Max, getting the word out, we really appreciate that. And, uh, and hopefully we get more users using it. Matt, tell us where people can find the app and how to search for it. You can go on the, uh, Apple, I, uh, a- Apple app store and search for fly Virga, the app called fly Virga. And uh, it'll come up. And like I said, it's a free app. It doesn't cost anything. And it's relatively intuitive. There really isn't even an instruction manual for it. You should be able to figure it out really just by hitting a few buttons and getting going. And is that two separate words, fly Virga or one word? Two separate words, fly Virga. <laughs> That's great. Well, Matt, I think in the future, you might become known as Mr. Pyrep. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks, Max. That would be great if I did. That would be great if I did. I appreciate you helping us get the word out. Well, my thanks to Matt Lane for joining us and congratulations for really cracking that last piece of the puzzle as to how to go from a, an iPhone app to uh, generating a pyre up that actually enters into the national system. So now it's up to you. Let's go ahead and do our part. Go ahead and download the Verga app and I've included a link in the show notes. Coming up next, more of your questions and emails right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Let's start off with the good news department. Mega supporter Jim Goldfuss passed a CFI check ride. So congratulations to you, Jim. He said he could be teaching as soon as the middle of next week at the Republic Airport. He wrote back to me, thanks for the congratulations. You and your podcast played a very important role in my success from the instrument rating up through the commercial and CFI. Thanks. Well, you're welcome, Jim. And thanks so much for being a mega supporter. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Andrew Dure. He says, thanks for the in-depth review of the El Cajon accident. I may have missed it, but one big factor is basing a medevac business in an airport with such limited approaches. I know primary responsibility is the flight crew, but this airfield sets them up for failure. If it's true that they have to return the aircraft to standby service for the next call, as Mr. Mark implied, there's a professional reason to get home despite get homeitis. None of the approaches have friendly minimums and flying such fast planes is a real challenge if the weather is minimal. Seems like a bad location for this sort of work where you have to be ready to launch and return in all sorts of weather. And yeah, no question about it. This does seem like a very difficult airport to operate or jet from, especially when weather is close to the minimums. Since the company that uh, operates jet is based in El Cajon, my guess is that this happens to be close to somebody's home, and that's why it was based there. Now, Rob was talking about the kinds of pressures that some 135 operations might have to get back to home base. We really don't know anything about whether those kinds of pressures existed in this operation. And let me tell you about a long phone call I had with mega supporter Tim Delaney this weekend. It was really fascinating, and I wanted to share this with you and also get your ideas. Tim is now based up in Idaho, flies an SR-22T, and he described a recent trip when he was somewhere around flight level 200. He said it was cold outside below minus 20 degrees C. Prior to the descent where he knew he would be entering the clouds and picking up ice, he turned on his Fiki system to pre-coat the wings with TKS fluid, which should prevent formation of the ice. He had primed the system by running it previously so that the fluid should have come out immediately, but nothing happened. (laughs) He went on to pick up some ice he said that he picked up uh, approximately a quarter of an inch of rime ice on the uh, the descent. But this really got him curious, and he started to uh, do a little bit of research as to what was going on. And he learned that under certain conditions, you can get what's called flash evaporation. Well, I looked that up, and what Wikipedia tells us is that flash evaporation or partial evaporation is the partial vapor that occurs when a saturated liquid stream undergoes a reduction in pressure, now that's the key part here, by passing through a throttling valve or other throttling device. Now, in his case, the pressure outside at uh, flight level 200 is going to be considerably lower than the pressure of the TKS fluid inside the tank. It goes on to say, if the saturated liquid is a single component liquid, for example, propane or liquid ammonia, a part of the liquid immediately flashes into vapor. Both the vapor and the residual liquid are cooled to the saturation temperature of the liquid at the reduced pressure. This is often referred to as auto-refrigeration, 
and is the basis of most conventional vapor compression refrigerator systems. If the saturated liquid is a multi-component liquid, which would be the case with TKS fluid, for example, a mixture of propane, isobutane, and normal butane, the flashed vapor is richer in the more volatile components than is the remaining liquid. Well, as part of his research, Tim found in the manual for the SR22T this statement. It says that prolonged operation of the system, now this is the, the FIKI system, the anti-icing system in the aircraft, prolonged operation of the system in clear air above 15,000 feet MSL and temperatures less than minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 20 degrees C can result in flash evaporation of water and alcohol from the anti-ice fluid. This evaporation results in a glycol-rich fluid that could become gel-like on the wing surface until the aircraft enters precipitation or warmer temperatures. So Tim asked for my advice, and I told him, yeah, it's an interesting situation. I'm not sure that there really is a good uh, solution to this. I told him that I didn't think there was any point in trying to continue to run it to pre-coat the wings, but that he would probably want to start running it immediately upon entering the clouds, which is what he did before and, of course, still picked up some ice. Now, he came up with a solution which I thought was ingenious. He said that uh, in the descent where this occurred, he was descending at about four to 500 feet per minute for passenger comfort. Obviously, you don't want your passenger's ears popping and 500 feet per minute is a great rate of descent for doing that. He said in the future, what he would probably do is make sure that he is well over the valley before he starts descending into his home and that he would let his passengers know that he would be descending at a higher rate, perhaps around a thousand feet per minute to cut the time that he would be in the ice in half, which would also greatly reduce the ice accumulation. So let me put this out to you. If you have any suggestions on what Tim could be doing in that situation, please share them with us and we'll pass them along. And here's a message from Patreon supporter, Rich Perry. He says, I received your reply to my feedback suggestion that you read in episode 211. As I mentioned in my feedback, I'm a rusty pilot, definitely not current. I learned to fly at the Hayward airport that's here in California but never made it over to Palo Alto. I now virtually fly using MSFS 2020 and often attempt to recreate in the simulator the flying situations mentioned in your podcast and others. I agree with your assessment about student pilots shouldn't be using PC simulators for learning because there is too much focus on the inside of the cockpit instead of looking outside. Your podcasts are the highest quality, very informative, and very professional. Your guests are great. Well, Rich, thanks so much for that feedback and look forward to seeing you across the bay or Palo Alto someday. And here's an email from a new Patreon supporter who asked to remain anonymous. He says, hi, Max. I've been listening to your podcast for about a year now, so I thought it was about time I stopped freeloading and signed up to the $20 a month level. I'm currently working on my private at Ells Tree Airport, just north of London, England. Your podcasts have been a fantastic way of staying connected to aviation during the downtimes, and they have also definitely made me a safer pilot. Twice on a recent solo circuits lesson, your podcast came into my head as I was about to make a mistake. Firstly, I was about to adjust my seat as I was taxiing to the hold, but I stopped the airplane, applied the brake, and then adjusted it, with you looking down on me saying, don't do anything else while you are taxiing. <laughs> Good for you. He says, I was then running quite wide on base to final and was about to kick in a boatload of rudder to straighten up, and Catherine's voice cut across me and I stopped, remembering your podcast on the dangers of doing this when you are low and slow. I actually had plenty of time to just ease it around and straighten up using only aileron. I also surprised my instructor recently when I told the tower, unable, I'll hold a minute for rotor wash when cleared for takeoff directly after a helicopter that had taxied across the runway in front of me. Thanks for all of your hard work. It's really appreciated. I love the show and looking forward to catching up on some of the bonus content. Well, thank you so much, Anonymous, for supporting the show, and I'm happy to hear the show is helping you out with your flying. And here's an email from Tad in Virginia. He says, hey, Max, love the podcast. You graciously answered my previous question, but I have one of a different sort. I'm getting back into flying after a 20-year hiatus with the intention to get my CFI as a second career when I retire in 18 to 20 months, working with my AME to get a special issuance. While I wait for Oklahoma City, can you recommend an online instrument ground program and commercial to get the written exams knocked out? Also, I have never flown a glass cockpit. Do you recommend sticking with the steam gauges that I trained in before or switch to glass? Thank you for your time and your knowledge, Tad. Well, Tad, let's uh, break down the written exams really into two different parts. 
uh, I would say that one of the best resources I've seen for studying for the written exams would be the books that come out of asa2fly.com. Uh, they have all roughly six, 700 questions that are going to be on those written exams. And the nice thing is they have a pullout section in the back of the book, which is identical to the uh, pullout section that you use when you're doing your written exam. It's got all the diagrams and legends, and it's great to have that because often many of the answers that you're going to find are buried in the legends, which the question doesn't refer to directly, but which are handy to know if you've thumbed through the book ahead of time. Uh, so I love those books from asa2fly.com. But besides studying for the written, you really want to be studying broadly, a broad set of knowledge that's going to come in handy for the oral portion of your check ride and for you know just being knowledgeable when you fly the airplane uh, throughout your flying career. And for that, I really like the online courses. You're going to get probably 25 to 30 hours of video. And I recommend that people go to sporties.com. I've seen their uh, commercial course, which I think is really excellent. They sent that out for me to take a look at it and review. Years ago, I was back at their home base in Ohio, and I got to see their uh, center where they were creating new videos for what was then the new instrument course, and I thought that was excellent as well. So I'd recommend you get test prep books from ASA2Fly.com, and then you look at the online videos from Sporties. And then in terms of uh, whether to fly a glass cockpit or steam gauges, I generally recommend that people do their instrument training in the kind of cockpit that they plan to fly most once they become IFR rated and are out flying in the system on their own. So if you plan to fly mostly around gauge airplanes in the future, get your IFR on that. Or if you think you'll do most of your flying in a glass cockpit aircraft, then definitely do that. Uh, flying instruments in these two type of aircraft is significantly different. So you really want to get really good at the version that you plan to do uh, most often. And in the beginning of the show, I mentioned that we were rated number one for aviation podcast for most of last week. Those rankings come from the Apple podcast app, and it's really the only uh, rankings that I'm aware of for, uh, for podcast. It shows that there are more than 200 aviation podcasts out there for you to choose from. And we ranked up there for most of the week as number one. Now our ranking bounces around all the time, but we're always um, among the top uh, few podcasts. And what drives that? A number of different things, but for sure, when you recommend to your friends that they listen to the show, once they start to hit subscribe, which of course is free, you just hit the subscribe button or the follow button if you're using Apple Podcast, that helps move us up in the rankings. So please go ahead and continue to share the show, and thanks for helping to make us number one. And here's a message from new mega supporter Eric Stovall. He says, I'm from Fishers, Indiana. I fly a Cirrus. I've listened to the show since 2018 and see your podcast as one of my primary sources of new aviation news and information. Having listened for more than three years and thinking I should, all caps, support your show financially and recommending you to several people, I finally quit procrastinating and started the financial support. Your work is high quality and I respect the professional manner in which you conduct your shows. This is very, very nice. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. It's clear that you take your content creation seriously and anyone listening to your show is gaining knowledge that may save their life someday. While I realize you have stayed away from paid advertising, which is true, we haven't accepted advertising at this point, and I'm sure you have your reasons. I would not be at all offended if you had ads during your show. I watch several content creators on YouTube and listen to several podcasts. I am not bothered by ads during the shows I enjoy. Given you have the highest rated aviation podcast, I imagine the financial benefits of advertising would help reward you for your time. Also, learning about products and services is not unwelcome. Plus, as you said, only 4% of listeners contribute financially. I imagine there is data telling creators how advertising affects financial support from listeners. So I'm sure you know what you're doing. Again, thank you for your show and the valuable knowledge you share. Well, Eric, thank you so very much. You're incredibly kind and thank you for your support. And yes, people have approached us in the past about running advertising, but I've chosen to keep this for the time being a listener supported show. So hopefully people enjoy that. And now let me mention some very special people. Perhaps you know some of these people, see if you recognize any of their names. And I'm really grateful to these people as we've lost 10 supporters in the last two months simply because credit cards expired and they haven't gone into Patreon to update their credit card. So we always need lots of new supporters just to help keep us even with where we were before. So if you've been thinking about supporting the show, now is a great time to do it. Uh, and you can just do that very easily by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, 
which takes you to our Patreon site, or go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal, where you can make a one-time donation or even a monthly donation if you have a PayPal account. And first, my thanks to new mega supporter Jim Winner, who edited his pledge up to $50 a month. He says, I'm thrilled to be back in the left seat after a three-year absence. I own a Cirrus SR20 G3. I value these podcasts tremendously. This $50 is very inexpensive tuition. Well, thanks so much, Jim. I appreciate that. Other new patrons include Thomas Dean Weebel, who edited his pledge up to $8. And happy birthday, Thomas. Francis Rose at $8 a month. Mark Astley, $20. Stephen Schroeder edited his pledge up to $8 a month. Rich Perry, we read his email earlier, he's at $20 a month. Brett Pierce, $8 a month. Armin Eskijan at $35 a month. Ryan Parsons, $8 a month. Raymond Melendez, $20 a month. Also David Stockter at $20 and Stephen Bartos at $35 a month. Thank you so much for signing up via Patreon. We've also had some one-time donations. Thanks to Steve Hahn for $20. Kyle Campbell for $93, Rafael Golden Garcia from Madrid at $8, and an anonymous donation for $100. And thanks to everyone who supports the show in other ways by sending us your email and feedback and by telling other people about the show and encouraging them to subscribe. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>